For the intro, I can do this. Hey there, I'm Chitta Fahadans. What do you think? Welcome to chapter three of module three in the Anamorphic Cookbook. In this chapter, we'll talk about sensor size and its correlation to celluloid or film sizes. Look at examples from great looking films and discuss if bigger is always better. Then we'll wrap up by bringing in focal reducers and their effects on the virtual sensor size. In this module's previous chapters, I covered the convoluted anamorphic modes, then talked about shooting with frame guides for cropping in post. This is useful in case your camera doesn't have an anamorphic mode or if you want more flexibility when processing the footage. If you're new to the cookbook, I'd say check out the first two modules as well. Those go into the importance of anamorphics to film, how they boost your production value, and a lot of how the lenses work. If you want to support niche content like this, become a member of the channel through the join button below and unlock a handful of cookbook videos right away. By being a member, you also get better support through our Discord server where you can share your work and questions and be a part of a community of like-minded people. Now that we spent some time talking about the best use of the sensor area, I figured we should talk about the sensor area itself. Get ready to memorize your camera sensor size and a bunch of other numbers for comparisons. There has been a wide variety of film sizes and aspect ratios during the early CinemaScope development, and you can find more info about them in the reference links for this video. That's the description. I'm only covering the most popular ones here. 35 millimeters for historical reasons, Super 35, now also called APS-C, and large format, which is popularly known as VistaVision or full frame. It all starts with four perforation 35mm film, considering a little bit of area for an optical soundtrack. This made the size of the image area 21.3 by 18.16 millimeters. It gives us an aspect ratio of 1.17 to 1, which is pretty square. But once you throw an anamorphic lens in front, it expands to the most popular 2.35 to 1. To give you some reference, the Super 35 sensor in a Panasonic EVA-1 measures 24.6 by 12.97 millimeters. It is a bit wider, yet fairly shorter than the original 35 millimeter film negative area. The aspect ratio is much narrower than 35 millimeters, closer to Techniscope size. Speaking of Techniscope, I can count in one hand the number of people that pointed out the good, the bad, and the ugly example in the very first cookbook video, which wasn't shot anamorphic at all, but Techniscope spherical. Super 35 started to take off in the 1980s and became really popular during the 90s. It involves capturing images on the part of the film that was previously reserved for the optical soundtrack. This way, you're using an area of 24.89 by 18.6 millimeters, and that gives us roughly 20% more film area than 35 mil with an optical soundtrack. It makes the capture aspect ratio four by three, or 1.33 to one, and once you throw an anamorphic lens in front of it, your aspect ratio extends to 2.66 to 1. Super 35 is a production format, and it has to be conformed to the standard 2.39 to 1 aspect ratio for delivery, meaning cropping or masking is necessary. Most classics and big budget anamorphic productions you can think of were shot on Super 35 film format or digital equivalent. Among these, we have Blade Runner, shot by Jordan Cronenworth using Panavision's Panaflex camera and Panavision's C-series anamorphics, along with 65mm spherical film for the visual effects shots. We also have Alien, shot by Derek Van Lent, again using Panavision's cameras and lenses. All of Spielberg's Indiana Jones films are shot on Super 35 film. Actually, most of Spielberg's epic stories are shot on anamorphic Super 35. Then we can talk about the original Star Wars trilogy, and I bet someone is saying, they also used VistaVision there, which is true. Just remember VistaVision was used for shooting elements and visual effects though, not the main body of the film. The bulk of the story is on Super 35 anamorphic, 
shot on Panavision's silent reflex, the PSR. Since we're talking about Star Wars, George Lucas was pushing so hard for the digital revolution on episodes 2 and 3 that he used a Sony HDC F950 camera for those films. This Sony sensor has a size of 9.6 by 5.4 millimeters, so much, much, much smaller than Super 35. Can you tell? Yes. In more recent times, some of the favorites are Killing Them Softly, which used a single 50mm T1.1 lens from Panavision on Super 35 film. Annihilation, shot by Rob Hardy, combined Panavision's Primo Anamorphics on a Sony F65 and G-Series on a Red Weapon for some exquisite visuals. Ex Machina, again by Hardy, also uses the F65 and F55 with Panavision and Cook Crystal lenses. All of these are Super 35 sized sensors. If we're pushing hardcore into the full-blown anamorphic look, lens flares and all, J.J. Abrams' Star Trek was lensed by Dan Mendel using Panavision's cameras and lenses. Again, everything on Super 35. Super 8, surprisingly, was not shot in Super 8. Larry Fong uses a crazy mix of film sizes, 8mm, 16mm, but tops at Super 35mm, even for when they use digital cameras. I had a hard time in this chapter because Panasonic doesn't have a variety of Super 35 cameras. The EVA-1 is the best example, and that has an EF mount, which makes things more challenging, as we'll see on the next chapter. Full frame is decidedly more expensive than a smaller sensor, but looking at a camera like the S5, the price isn't that different when compared to the BGH-1 or even the almost old GH-5. And being able to use full frame for some situations, while get an anamorphic crop in others, is pretty great. My only irk with Panasonic's anamorphic modes in their full frame lineup is it's sized as 35mm Academy, so 20.93 by 15.78, which is smaller than the Super 35 size we are aiming for. And since we're talking about full frame, there was Vista Vision. A truly excessive idea, rolling 35mm film horizontally inside the camera instead of vertically, and almost doubling the film area for much more detail and light, just like a 35mm stills camera does. The exposure area for this monstrosity is 36 by 24mm. Using VistaVision film and anamorphic lenses is a very recent development in filmmaking. And we're able to achieve that on the S1H open gate mode in combination with Cook's full frame anamorphics. Bigger than VistaVision, we have a handful of films shot on 65 millimeter film and anamorphics. Ben-Hur is a classic, creating an absolutely epic setting for its epic story. More recently, we had Tarantino's The Hateful Eight, which revived Panavision's 1.25 times lenses on 65mm film for 70mm projection. You can notice lots of strong visual choices through that film that I think come from the character brought on by these lenses. Last, we have Rogue One, which uses the same lenses as Tarantino, but in a sci-fi setting, and the Alexa 65's enormous digital sensor. If you're curious about what system was used for shooting some of your favorite films, check Shot on What. The link is in the description below. For some mysterious reason, there is a growing trend towards even bigger formats than VistaVision or full frame. While I admit I'm eager to try medium format anamorphic, this is not something I am super keen on covering in this program. Stay tuned on the channel for later developments. There might be an extra episode on that. It's common to use Super 35 and APS-C as interchangeable terms. Many of us that focus on shooting video rather than photos on DSLR and mirrorless cameras are used to those names, and some manufacturers use them as the same thing in their menus. But is that really accurate? This would mean we are surrounded by cheap sensors in the same size tier as Hollywood's biggest hits. Now let's go back to APS-C and look at the numbers. As I mentioned a bit earlier, 
the EVA1 sensor measures 24.6 by 12.97 millimeters. When you stack that against Super 35's 24.89 by 18.6, we can see that the EVA1 sensor is indeed a bit shorter. The other key aspect that is commonly overlooked is when shooting video, we don't get to use the entire sensor, but a 16 by nine crop of it, losing the top and bottom. The EVA1 is a dedicated video camera, so this doesn't happen, but a lot of photo and video cameras will face this issue. This shrinks our digital negative size, and it's the absolute opposite of what we want when shooting anamorphic. So the cheap sensors around us are almost as wide as Super 35, but definitely not as tall. Looking at the capture area, a Super 35 sensor is about 30% taller than an APS-C sensor in video mode. If we wanna match Hollywood, we need a bit bigger of a sensor. And we have two options here. Option one, we step into full frame cameras that have Vista Vision sized sensors, 36 by 24 millimeters. Although again, they have a 16 by nine crop when shooting video, losing the top and bottom of the frame, the exact thing they were trying to gain. This results in a 36 by 20.2 millimeters capture area, which is much wider than Super 35, but only 1.5 millimeters taller. Special treatment to the S1H here, which allows you to record the entire sensor area for cropping in post. Gold star. Option two, we use a focal reducer to virtually boost our sensor size. Let's add a focal reducer to our ongoing Super 35 sensor example. Focal reducers can have different magnification powers, so we'll go with the most common one. 0.71 times. Down to the math, we divide 24.6 and 12.97 by 0.71. This results in a 34.64 by 18.26 millimeters virtual recording area. This is 10 millimeters wider than Super 35, but almost a perfect match to the 18.6 millimeter height. Excellent. I'd say this is better than using full frame like the previous approach. Plus, it gives you good reframing room on both sides. Important to remember, this boosted size isn't real. This is a virtual sensor emulated by the focal reducer. This is in general a super confusing topic, so there's a few videos in the description to address the workings of focal reducers in general. I believe Super 35 to be the best production format for anamorphic shooting. If the numerous examples that came before were not enough to convince you, Super 35 will give you the most options among adapters and cine lenses. That's what I'm thinking through this chapter. But if you still want to shoot on a bigger sensor, let's talk about that for a bit. You can push the envelope just a bit by shooting with a full frame stills camera on video mode for those measly extra 1.5 millimeters in sensor height. Or you could step up to Panasonic S1H for full Vista Vision sensor size. This increase in sensor size will impact your results in terms of performance with much shallower depth of field and a more limited choice of focal lengths for taking lenses when using adapters. The larger sensor also limits your options when it comes to renting lenses, since most cinema anamorphics were designed for Super 35 only and not larger sensors. Large format cine anamorphics were not very popular in the beginning, with Ben-Hur being the absolute best example of it. And they were forgotten until Tarantino brought them back for The Hateful Eight. There are multiple articles on how he used these very old lenses that had been collecting dust for decades since there was nothing new in that field. This kick-started some development like Cook's full-frame anamorphics. Even Panavision only got into the large format game in 2016 with their Ultra Vistas. More budget-friendly than those are Vazen's most recent offerings in 2020. We still haven't seen many large format anamorphic features. The other examples that come to mind are Rogue One and The Mandalorian. Star Wars and anamorphic, huh? they do have a trend of pushing the technical envelope. My question here is more of a practical nature. Do you really need a full frame or Vista Vision sensor for shooting anamorphic? 
I'd love to hear why, especially when we take into account it's so much cheaper and lighter to shoot aiming for Super 35. You're looking at much more limited taking lenses in more expensive cameras. To me, this is a gear acquisition syndrome or a gas-oriented approach to anamorphic shooting, where we're pining over the complexity of the setup instead of how efficiently it works. I said I was gonna give you the best path for anamorphic shooting with the best production value versus investment ratio. And Super 35 versus full frame is a clear choice of not maximizing your investments. It's anamorphic on a budget after all. <laughs> Says that and shoots with $30,000 cooks. I mean, the S1H is a beast and I love it, but it's more than triple the price of the GH5 and almost double the weight. If you can afford the difference, great. Otherwise, go for the budget option and be happy. A larger sensor leads to more expenses and not that much of a difference in terms of image quality. If you're obsessing about some YouTube video that made you drool after you saw the gear used, think of all the films you watched and loved but didn't see the cinematographer flexing about the equipment used. When in doubt, always focus on how the equipment is used to best serve the story. Now that we're past this difficult conversation, take a break and think for a little bit before heading into the next chapter. While you enjoy your coffee, or hot chocolate for me, hit the like button and help others find this video. On the next chapter, we'll talk about flange distances and mount types. It's a mix of subjects that's getting a little more visibility, but needs to be much more popular to create a meaningful impact in our niche. Flange distance and mounts are key to making sure you're getting lenses that work with your camera. So I'll see you there. Chitu Fahadengs, out.